Uh, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Professor Wang Gungwu. And we'd also like to thank him for sitting through uh, a very long day of talks at the age of 93. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Professor Wang Gungwu is a man that le uh, needs little introduction, but he is the chairman of the East Asian Institute and university professor at the National University of Singapore. He is a pioneer in the field of Southeast Asian history and has published numerous books on Chinese influence and migration in the region. He is the recipient of many prestigious awards, including the title Commander of the British Empire, the Tang Prize in Sinology, and the Distinguished Service Order from Singapore, just to name a few. Please join me in welcoming our final speaker, Professor Wang Gangwu. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. I, I must congratulate Michael Lui and his team for organizing this fascinating uh, conference on a subject that is of, of great, greater and greater interest to all of us. As you can see, he's very, very thoughtful. He's provided me with the chair because he knows how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, I am fascinated by the very subjects that were raised this, this morning and this afternoon, uh, covering many of the problems that have been on our minds for, for quite a while. And it goes to show, I think one thing it does show, how different times you approach history differently. In other words, we recognize the difference between history and history written by historians. They're obviously different because you say, then you ask who are the historians and uh, what are they writing from? Whereas history as it happened, well, who knows? We don't really know. It's, it's, that's what happened. And what we try to do as historians is try and capture some of the realities behind what we imagine to have happened from the sources available. And as you have heard, heard, heard from Professor Peter Boschberg, how fantastically variable those sources can be and how difficult it is to provide a correct interpretation of them. So in a way, I thought the best thing I can do is not to go over some of this ground. We are all reimagining the past all the time. We may not be conscious of it, but we do because, as Michael we said at the beginning, the present influences how we write about the past. And that has always been true. In fact, uh, if you all remember your history textbooks and all the books of, in history that you read, uh, you're always aware of the fact that uh, uh, whoever writes the history determines the, the way the narrative is told. And uh, we are influenced by the viewpoint, the perspective of the historian, and he or she, whether they like it or not, reflect the values and ideas of the present, of the life, of the time, his, his, his own time. From that point of view, when I submitted my title to Michael, I was offering, I was thinking of offering a more general uh, review of what uh, Southeast Asian history has been like and where Singapore's position in Southeast Asia, uh, how much Singapore's position in Southeast Asia tells us about Singapore. But I think uh, having heard what has been said the whole day today, I think I might simplify it a little bit more and to say that, uh, to go back to the title of the conference itself, reimagining history. The question then is, who is reimagining? Who is guiding you in reimagining? Are you reimagining for yourself? Are you reimagining for your community? for your nation, for your particular group, or for your particular set of interests, maybe class interests, or ethnic interests, or community, community or religious interests, wherever your starting point is, 
you are probably reimagining it to some extent with that background in mind. But I, I don't want to go into all that, simply to remind you of the fact that the question of reimagining for, requires us to ask what was the Southeast Asian history in the first place that we need to reimagine. And if we start with that, we assume that there was a Southeast Asian history. Then I ask myself, was there one? And this takes me to reflect on my own understanding of what I have been reimagining about Southeast Asian history myself in my own lifetime and uh, how that has changed over those years. And I, my starting point is, and uh, I think we're all aware of that, that uh, this region we call Southeast Asia did not have a name. Uh, Professor Borschberg referred to names like Insulind and further, further India and others. None of them really applied to what we call Southeast Asia because what we call Southeast Asia today has a border. And borders are absolutely new to our part of the world. There has never been formal borders of any kind, any particular kind that we recognize today in the whole of the history of this region that I know of. Borders were invented in very modern times. Exactly when, we can argue about that, but they were invented. And Southeast Asia, as a region with borders, was definitely a very modern thing. As Professor Boschberg also mentioned, it's very modern. But more specifically than that, it was introduced with those borders, very clear borders in mind. It was introduced during the Second World War, towards the end of the Second World War, when the term a Southeast Asia Command was created and was headquart with headquarters in Sri Lanka. And it was created by the British, and the term was invented by the strategists in London. I don't think the Americans used it for a while anyway. It was the British who thought in those terms. And they were strategists that were thinking about the future. They were not talking about the past. They didn't say anything about Southeast Asian history. They had just created a name for a command which was to perform an actual military task, which was to drive out the Japanese and restore British imperial interests in the region, but also the imperial interests of the uh, allies, like the French and the Dutch and so on. In, in any case, Southeast Asia Command was uh, seen in that light, in, in a very clear strategic uh, uh, sense of what they meant. And what they meant was very clear. It had borders. And the borders were the borders of that region with India on the one side and China on the other. And it was quite explicitly explained. This, this region is different because these strategists with foresight, and this is where we, we see, we can actually see them thinking ahead. And what they were thinking ahead was the world has changed after the Second World War. The empires are coming to an end sooner or later. Decolonization, not yet a word used, but gradually more widely used, was inevitable. And this was de determined not only, just, not only just by the people themselves who wanted, them, wanted these imperialists to leave, but by the leaders of the West, the United States, demanded that the empires all come to an end. At least they saw it as a, the future must be a world without empires. We will start afresh because the, fir the First World War and the Second World War taught the world something, that with nation states and national empires, they would fight each other to the bitter end, cause tremendous damage to the world, and ultimately self-destruct. They destroyed the worlds that they had created a century and a half earlier on. And in, in two world wars, they basically destroyed what they had themselves built. And this was recognized. And to that, to the extent that the American, the idealistic American leaders of the time recognized that, they saw that what the West represented, what the Enlightenment project of the 18th century represented, 
was coming to an end if you continue with this idea of nation state and fighting for national empires against one another, there is no future for mankind. There will always be wars and continual destruction and ultimately probably destruction of humanity itself because by that time, as the Americans themselves knew, they were building the atom bomb and uh, something was going to totally transform the history of the, of, of the world, of humanity. Uh, and they saw it, whether they liked it or not, they saw that was in the, in, in the future. That's entirely possible. So all these things were conscious uh, in the minds of the, the leaders of the time. So there was an acceptance that they would have to withdraw from Southeast Asia. And what were they withdrawing from? They were withdrawing from a region, they not yet called a region, but an area where every state was a colony of one kind or the other. Uh, there were different ones under the Dutch, the ones under the French, the ones under the British, and there was even the Americans in the, in the Philippines who had taken the, taken the Philippines from the Spaniards. In name, Thailand was independent, but in effect, it was actually under the dominance of the French and the British uh, during, during most of the 19th century. So all of Southeast Asia were under imperial control as colonies of one kind or another, or protectorates as they call them uh, in some cases. So it is in that context that Southeast Asia was born as a region between India and China. Why India and China? The British strategists were very clear about that. China was clearly a nationalistic China. In fact, it was called nationalist China. Zhong Hua Min Guo, the Republic of China, was na nationalistic. They were, the, nas the government was under the Kuomintang, which is a nationalist party. So a nationalist China would certainly uni be united, uh, and, and in fact, it was united after the war. It was united and you'll be hostile towards the West. This is the, the British calculation. India, demanding independence from the British for several decades, will have to be given independence. I think the British knew perfectly well they could not stay very long. It was a, just a matter of a few years. They will have to leave India, and a nationalistic India that was hostile to British interests would, would not, would not be helpful for them. So if they want to have any interests, uh, any of their British interests protected at all in the region, they had to do something about Southeast Asia. And the strategic interest was if they can keep Southeast Asia, whether divided or otherwise, somehow separate from India and China, who are definitely going to be nationalistic and hostile, they could probably preserve some of their economic and other interests in, in the region. And this is particularly important, of course, for the British Empire, which is worldwide. And from the British point of view, there was Australia and New Zealand at the other end of the British Empire. And Southeast Asia was very strategic in so far as the British would want to keep in, keep in contact and keep in direct imperial uh, linkages, connect, connect, connections with Australia and New Zealand. So Southeast Asia was strategic in, in a whole range of reasons why it should be, but most of all for economic interest. Because if they lose the, lose the uh, colonial control over the old empire, they would have business interests, which are, of course, vital to the uh, British imperial economy as a whole. So I, also many, many other complicated issues, I won't go into that, but essentially what I'm saying is that Southeast Asia was a creation of the residual interests that former empires of this region identified as being vital to their own economic interests and they would like to keep, it, keep this place separate from both India and China. And if they can do that, they can at least operate freely and have and retain and protect some of the interests in the region. From their point of view, it was very logical, very rational. If you actually read the, the literature of that period, it's very, very, very well reasoned and, and carefully done. Now, I remember this very well because I was a student in 1949 in the University of Malaya in Bukit Timah campus, 
in uh, Singapore, so I was actually in Singapore. So I had a kind of Singapore perspective of this new Southeast Asia because it was actually in the University of Malaya that Southeast Asia produced the first books on South that produced the first books on Southeast Asia. You may not be you may not realize it today, but the first book of geography on Southeast Asia in the whole world was done by a professor of geography in the University of Malaya, Professor Dobby. And the first history of Southeast Asia was done by Brian Harrison, a professor of history at the University of Malaya. These were the first two books. That there was a second history of Southeast Asia, even more, uh, more, more uh, uh, fully developed by Professor D.G. Hall at the University of Rangoon, but again, another British uh, uh, colonial university. But it was the British colonial universities that first produced the books on Southeast Asia. So when I look at the word reimagine Southeast Asia, so I have to say, who imagined it first? The people who imagined it first were the British. And they had, they, and they, set, they set out the, the uh, Southeast Asia in Dobby's book. Interestingly enough, Dobby's book included the Philippines because the British actually Southeast Asia Command did not include the Philippines. The Philippines was part of the American sphere of uh, Pacific interest. But Dobby's book, as a geographer, he saw in terms of geography, you can't leave out the Philippines. That's obviously part of Southeast Asia. So the first book of Southeast Asia actually includes the Philippines. And interestingly enough, so, does, uh, so did uh, Brian Harrison's history of Southeast Asia. But it's interesting that DGE Hall, writing from the University of Rangoon, his first version of the history of Southeast Asia does not include the Philippines because he took the very strictly British understanding of the Southeast Asia Command, which did not include the Philippines. It was only in the second edition, in this revised edition, that he was, he was told that you can't leave out the Philippines. So he added the Philippines. Out. So you can imagine, the re, there was reimagining already there, trying to figure out what is this Southeast Asia. But the most important thing, as I said, it had borders. Once you recognize that it had borders, China on one side, India on the other, all the territories in between India and China would be Southeast Asia. That's how it started. Until that time, and I think Peter and others who, go, who know the sources all the way back to the Tamasic days of, uh, of 14th century, uh, we knew no borders. There was no such a common name for the region. I had suggested uh, that we use the maritime Southeast Asia using the Malay word Nusantara to cover it. And, uh, but for the mainland, there wasn't even a single name by anybody that I know of. And the, when the uh, French and the British tried to sort out what to do in the, on the mainland, main peninsula of, of, the, of the region, they used to call it Indochina. The Indochina Peninsula, and the French called their part Andochine. Indochina, quite openly, because there's no name for it. We have, this, we have numerous countries. There was Thailand, Burma already. There was Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, three parts of Vietnam, which the French controlled. And uh, Andochine, Indochina, was what they call it. In other words, nobody could decide what to call this region. Nobody saw it as a region, but given the borders, after 1945, and as those borders became more and more recognized, uh, widely recognized by the people within the region as well, they were also suddenly conscious that if we are now free and we're building our new nations, independent of those national empires, and now we are part of Southeast Asia, what does it mean? But if you look at the histories of that, of that period, between 1945, or, uh, let us say, between the 1950s, when the first books appeared, until about 1980s, I think you will find very few, if any, books by Southeast Asians about Southeast Asian history. They were all written by foreigners, by British, American, joined later on by the Dutch, the French, 
and then German and other scholars and Japanese scholars came in, but all from outside the region. And outside the region, they saw the advantage of recognizing this region as a region because it clearly separated from China and India. And I want to underline this because this is the significant part of Southeast Asia that is not India and not China. And, and this is what they emphasized. So what, what really happened was the discovery of Southeast Asia, you might say, the imagining, going through the imagining, was actually done from a Western point of view, external to the region. And if you look at all the history books written up to, I say, 1980s, uh, they were all done from outside the region. And this is in itself very interesting. So the imagining of Southeast Asian history was done outside the region. So when did the people within the region think about ASEAN seriously? Strictly speaking, it began after the formation of the first ASEAN, but there was only five countries in ASEAN, and it was in a very different context. Now, if you look at it, again, we took at what was, a, what was the timing of that ASEAN thing. It was done entirely in the context of the politics, international politics of the time, of the war, between a uh, so-called Cold War between the United States-led allies and the Soviet Union and its, uh, its uh, uh, link linkage and its, its uh, related states, uh, uh, allied states. In that Cold War, ASEAN was formed basically as anti-communist group in alliance with the West. It was following, if you remember, it was following the fall of the Indonesian Communist Party uh, under Sukarno, uh, with Sukarno's support, but destroyed by Suharto, and a new regime began, which was pro the West and took an anti-communist line. And the five countries in, at that time that formed ASEAN were all anti-communist. In other words, it's not an objective decision what ASEAN was, it was a political decision at the time. I can go on, but now let me just, just illustrate what has happened each step of the way. And as I said, having lived through it, I can't turn away from this and say, this is a straight, very straightforward. It wasn't straightforward. Nothing was predictable. We could not have predicted that there would be an ASEAN. Because at the time when, I, when Indonesia was under Sukarno, it, was, it had the largest communist party in the world the PKI. Nobody imagined that that PKI could have been destroyed within a year of Suharto's uprising and, and, and replaced completely by anti-communist uh, government that lasted ever since then. There have been, uh, Indonesia has been anti-communist ever since. Despite the fact that there are many Indonesian people who are probably quite sympathetic with uh, some of the ideals of the PKI. But that's one story. At the other end, there were communist countries in Southeast Asia. The Americans were already committed to a Vietnam War. In other words, the Cold War was, not, was no longer cold, in, not in Asia, Southeast Asia anyway. It was a hot war uh, being fought in Southeast Asia. What are we doing in this hot war that came out of the Cold War in, 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 in the West? Well, if you are small enough, you do what you are, you can't help doing what you have to do. And since they were going to fight over Vietnam, the Americans actually, and this is quite, this is quite exceptional, incidentally, they really sent a large number of troops, um, probably more than they sent to Korea in, in fighting Vietnam, because it was basically Americans, uh, Marines and, and, and troops fighting there. But there you are, on our doorsteps within Southeast Asia, there was a hot war that went on to the 1970s, and by that time, a sense of Southeast Asian identity was emerging from within Southeast Asia. I don't think many people within Southeast Asia actually knew what that implied or what it would mean and what, would the, what the consequences would be. I'm not sure anybody was clear about that. But ASEAN was formed, begin with, as an anti-communist organization, but interestingly enough, the members of ASEAN, 
did not want to be seen simply as an anti-communist organization. They wanted to be actually neutral and separate. At the back of their minds, they didn't want to be just simply vassal states of some external power. They wanted to get some kind of independence. So when the Cold War ended, it is quite interesting how quickly ASEAN was invited the four former, basically, communist countries, especially in Indochina, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, but to some extent, Myanmar, or what the Burmese called Burmese socialism, was a kind of a near to communism at that time, were invited to join ASEAN. So you've, here was ASEAN, at least the leaders, if not the people, the leaders were determining the future of ASEAN. So in other words, there were a group of people who were the leaders, political leaders in Southeast Asia, who were already reimagining a Southeast Asian history, which consisted of all 10 members, independent countries of the region, something that I don't think anybody thought of earlier, before the end of the Cold War. In fact, if had the Cold War not ended, I don't know what would have happened. You see how all this is dependent on ch changes in history. So when we reimagine, or when we imagine or reimagine, you have to take into account where are you reimagining re from. Reimagining an anti-communist Southeast Asia is quite different from reimagining a non-communist. Non-communists and non-anti-communists, as the Singapore government used to say, we're not anti-communists, we're not communists, we're non-communists. So they invented a third term. So it was very useful. We're non-communists. So that became a non-communist reimagined Southeast Asia. So quite, quite, quite ingenious. But you can see how, how the history writers operate within a, a system that's constantly changing, with the perspectives changing about who is who and what is what. Which country was which, it was almost a matter of guessing which country would produce what kind of leaders who will lead you in which direction. I mean, who would have thought that Vietnam today would be more and more associated with the United States in order to defend itself against China? But that is part of the original idea to separate Southeast Asia from China. So Vietnam knew what they were doing when they, they accepted the invitation to join ASEAN. They knew exactly what they were doing. They, did, they joined ASEAN so that they would be separate and different from China, which they had been a country that they had been associated with a long, long time. I remember being very interested to notice that Harvard University had an East Asian program that included Vietnam and no Southeast Asian program for a long time because they looked at Vietnam as part of the, the Chinese framework of uh, nations because it had been part of the Sinic civilizational uh, uh, framework for centuries, dec um, millennia in fact. So Harvard University did not have Southeast Asian studies, but it had Vietnamese studies as part of East Asian studies. And it, in other words, you can see, there were, at least the academics didn't quite all agree on, the, on this. But Vietnam could see why people saw them that way, because they had, in fact, many, many features of their culture and civilization were very close to that of China. But they saw the opportunity to accept the invitation to join ASEAN so that they became separate from China. And this gave Vietnam a different way of, of looking, a different perspective of the world. And this was a decision made by the Vietnamese themselves. Now it goes to show, now you can see that Vietnamese history would be written in a very different way. It's written in the context of Southeast Asia and no longer in the context of an East Asian civilizational zone that has been linked with China for millennia. So you can see how history changes. So I'm coming back to this reimagining. So when Michael asked me to reimagine, I wasn't thinking of that at the time, but now that I listened to my friends and colleagues uh, this morning and afternoon, I thought I would bring this up to, to increase your awareness of how much uh, 
Those of us who are really imagining history are influenced by the current events that's happening. And this takes us to the present. I know Michael said at the beginning he doesn't want to deal with contemporary affairs, and I fully understand his uh, reluctance to do that. But uh, let us just, I just end on this note. It is related to current affairs. We are reimagining Southeast Asia even today in the context of no longer the simple world in which there was just the United Nations and its whole framework dominated by the United States and the West. We are talking about challenges to that new world, challenges to the United Nations framework, challenges about uh, US dominance, uh, hegemony over everything. In the language is being used now, which is unbelievable, could not have been used a few, a few decades ago. But they're being used today because people are now thinking quite naturally of a multipolar world. And a, a word which uh, to most Europeans and Americans are really unacceptable. They have, after all, come out of the Second World War, creating the United Nations in the belief that by recognizing a world of nation states, all independent, sovereign, and most of all, all equal in the eyes of the United Nations. Every nation is equal, however small and however large, so that Samoa is equal to the United States, by definition anyway. I mean, I know in reality it's not quite as simple as that, but uh, as you can see, by definition, that was a world system created in 1945 by the most idealistic people at the time. And for very good reason. They were trying to avoid a world in which people, nation states, would keep on trying to build empires and fight and kill each other. They were trying to bring about peace in the world. And who would not support that? Everybody agreed with that. What a wonderful thing, except that it didn't work. Almost immediately, we had the Cold War. And the Cold War was, well, the two major powers didn't dare fight each other because they both had nuclear, bomb, nuclear bombs, so they fought through their proxies. Other people did the fighting and killing, and they're still doing that. It's not, nothing has changed. It's still doing, even the Cold War has ended, but they're still going on doing that, and they will probably go on doing that. We don't know. But the fact is that that unipolar world in which the United Nations would answer all the questions for all humanity didn't really get off the ground. The Cold War ended, and the idea that the America would be the sole superpower that would assist in producing and providing peace and harmony throughout the world didn't work either, because they started getting into wars, which they didn't manage to win so easily, and they're finding it too expensive to fight everybody's war and trying to police everybody. They can't do it. So they're trying to reorganize something, but in the middle of it all, all those challenges of those new nation states that have been created, each of them have their own reason why they don't want to be dominated by anybody or any one single country or any one single group of countries. They would like to have some, some proximity to equality in, in the world of nations. Maybe not realistic, maybe not possible, but you can see they're reimagining. And for Southeast Asia, the reimagining of Southeast Asia as a separate region, a region with its own identity that is not going to be influenced by any of the major powers in a multipolar world is part of the reimagining of Southeast Asian history. And, uh, and to that extent, we can't avoid contemporary affairs, Michael, I'm afraid, uh, to, to some extent, because that is guiding the fact that we are here in this room talking about reimagining Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asian history. And it is not really possible for us to ignore the fact that Southeast Asia is in a different position today from what it was 10 years ago, more, at least about 20 years ago or more. And, and as the world changes, and as we try and look at our history, as we read back into the past, we're actually in a way re reading back to our future. Because our future is going to be written by and uh, would determine how the history is written. S somebody in the future will write the history of the, of, of, of the past in a different way from the way we are thinking or writing about today. I think I leave you with that rather uncomfortable thought. It makes me uncomfortable, so I can't imagine you are comfortable with that. 
But I think you have to accept the fact that throughout history, the victors write the history, the history gets rewritten by new victors, and every victor determines that only its history will count, and will try and determine it, and determine and dominate the narrative for future history writing, except that it never stays stationary. Whether that's for the good or for the bad, it's never going to be comfortable, and historians are always going to be on their feet, on the soles of their feet, as it were, as well as the tip of their feet, trying to figure out where they stood and how they should imagine the future. Thank you. For questions? Uh, Professor Wang, thank you so much uh, for your talk today. I have, I'm very curious, as someone uh, who has spent uh, a good part of your career uh, studying relations between China and uh, this region, uh, what you think of the current efforts by the, uh, the Chinese government. Sorry, I'm hard of hearing. Okay, I, I'm wondering what, what you think of the current efforts by the Chinese government to extend its claims and territorial control over the South China Sea based on the so-called nine-dash line uh, map, which again gets back to your point about border, establishing borders. Uh, whether there is in fact some historical uh, basis for this, or is it simply another uh, imperialist uh, enterprise? And I think, more importantly, is it inevitable that there will be some sort of uh, conflicts in the future between China and Southeast Asian countries, not to mention uh, America, but let's say uh, Vietnam, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, over the, the islands within the Nine Dash Line uh, uh, area. I hope this is not too sensitive a question no, no, to ask no, you. No, not at all. In fact, since, we, since you're on to contemporary matters, Matthew, forgive me, your, your father has asked a <laughs> contemporary question. Uh, I might as well face up to it. The fact is that when we changed over from the national empires and empires before 1945 to the post-1945 nation state, we changed the basic framework for everything. We introduced borders into Southeast Asia and in, in, into every part of the world. In, in fact, if I may just repeat the point, no part of the world had formal borders. No part of the world had the idea of sovereignty. All these concepts of sovereignty, drawing borders, and being nationalistic about what is yours and what is not yours, and so on, are very modern. They were all introduced in the late 18th century and part of the Enlightenment project, where the nation state was established. The first nation state, as you know, well, you may disagree, it's either you're the United States or France. The matter of a, a, a few years between them, when they declared themselves as republics, they got rid of their kings, and they decided that their citoyen was the, was the owner of the state, not the kings, aristocrats, or, or churchmen, or anybody else. The people own the state. That's a nation state. The American 13 colonies and France were the two countries that literally believed in that. So it was liberty, equality, fraternity for all citizens, everybody equal. That was unknown anywhere in the world. That was a revolution. And when you talk about it, excellent. Except that it also followed by the fact that this nation states that was created, especially in the case of France, obviously they already had an empire. And that became a national empire. In other words, the empire was no longer the empire of the king or the queen or a bunch of aristocrats. The empire was the empire of the citizens of the whole country. That is the idea of a national empire. Extraordinary idea, but it was a very powerful concept. And it, it developed the idea that each nation state would have the power, if they had the power, they would conquer territories elsewhere and 
expand their empires. And as you know, from then onwards, right up to the end of the 19th century, France and Britain expanded their empires all over the world. The whole world was basically divided between France and Britain, including in, in China, all the way to China. And in that context, we have introduced a new factor into the, into the equation, so to speak, and that is the nation state. So when we drove out the national empires, decolonized, what did we do? We wanted to have nation states, each one of us. And we still believe in it. We all, and the nation state in Southeast Asia, there are 10 nation states. Where were the 10 nation states before 1945? There were nothing like that. Where were the borders? There were no such thing. So where do these borders come from? And what are, what, how can you talk about history and borders when the history never mentioned borders in the far past? So these borders came out of 1945, after 1945. It came out of 1945 when China was under the Kuomintang and the, 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 it was the 11 dotted lines of the Kuomintang and was drawn in 1947, two years after the Japanese were defeated. And what happened was the, the Chinese were given the territories that were held by the Japanese, like including Taiwan and what was controlled from the headquarters in Taiwan. The headquarters in Taiwan were uh, uh, controlled by the Japanese Navy. So the command, the governor general of Taiwan was in charge of the whole of Southeast Asia uh, when, during the war, 1941 to 1945. When the Japanese retreated, it, the Chinese understood, I don't know exactly whether they're right or wrong, but they understood that they would take over from the Japanese what they had controlled in the area. But they didn't touch the land, but the Japanese did control South, the whole of South China Sea. Uh, I think you can, uh, you can argue that every coast of South China Sea was dominated by Japan during the three years of the war. From the Philippines, North Borneo, Malaysia, Thailand was actually a vassal state of the Japanese during the war, and so was French Indochina. French, because France was uh, the Vichy state was under the Germans, and Germans were allies, and the Vichy state in, in uh, Indochina was actually allies of the Japanese during, during that period. And the whole of Guangxi, Guangdong, Fujian, and Taiwan were under the Japanese during the war. So the whole of South China Sea was actually a Japanese sea for up to 1945. So whatever the reason, when the Japanese surrendered, the Chinese Kuomintang took over Taiwan. They moved their troops there. They took over the governor general's office. And the governor general's office must have been full of maps to show the South China Sea was a one sea and a Japan sea, sort of the sea owned by the Japanese. And we, I don't know, we can't find out exactly who drew the 11 dotted lines and how they did it. But in 1947, they published a map by the Kuomintang with the 11 dotted lines. The Kuomintang Nationalist China was an ally of the United States. The United States did not reject that. The United States accepted that because when the Chinese asked to, they didn't have a navy. The Kuomintang was very weak. They wanted to take over the largest island in the South China Sea, uh, Taiping Dao. I don't know, I've forgotten what his name in, in the local name now, Taiping Dao. It's just the northern, the central part of between the Spratleys and the Paracels. It's the biggest island. It's the biggest island in South in, in South in the South China Sea, and the Chinese wanted to send their own garrison to take over from the Japanese who were occupying it, and. Uh, they didn't have a navy to do that. They asked the American navy to transport their garrison to, to, uh, to Taiping Dao, and the Americans helped, did that. All I'm saying is that that map was published in 1947, and as far as I know, nobody said anything about it. It was uh, 11 dotted lines. I was a schoolboy at the time, and I remember textbooks, uh, in Chinese textbooks that had these 11 dotted lines, and nobody questioned, because at that time, people were arguing about the independence of the Philippines, independence of French Indochina, and the French were still hanging on to French Indochina. North Borneo and, and Sarawak were still under the British. So was the Malay Peninsula. 
Thailand was ba barely in, able to survive after the war and so on. And uh, apparently, nobody said anything for a long time. Uh, and the 11 dotted lines were in, in that map as long as I can remember. So in 1947, I saw that. But then two years later, the communists went and defeated the nationalists. Now, nobody expected that. I was in China, in Nanjing, in 1948, 47, 48. And uh, I was studying at the university. And uh, none of us thought that the communists would win, win and the nationalists would lose. The nationalists were being backed by the Americans 100% at that time against the communists. But somehow, they lost to the communists. And uh, the communists said, we have taken over China. And you see, the back to the words, borders, sovereignty, all these words came. These are not Chinese words. Incidentally, these are words derived from European, uh, European uh, nation state histories. So they've taken the words. So then they just accepted the border of China as it was when they took over from the Kuomintang in 1949. Now, rightly or wrongly, I, I'm not an international lawyer. I cannot comment on that. But what I'm saying is that who has any right to any kind of borders of water anyway? I mean, I don't understand that. I, mean, I understand borders on land. Somehow I understand because you can always build a fence between your land and the neighbor's land. That I can understand. But to draw a line in water, I don't understand. But anyway, here we are. <laughs> They're, they've drawn lines on water. Somehow nobody objected, nobody said anything. And the re when it started to become in in a subject of international concern, if I remember correctly, it was somewhere in the late 1970s when a series of reports came out by the oil companies. I forget, I forgot whether it was led by Shell or Esso, one of the uh, two groups of them, they did reports on the South China Sea which showed there was oil in the South China Sea. Then everybody got interested. <laughs> I, I leave it at that, but a it's a long story. But uh, that's, that's, and everybody started saying, hey, hey, this is my, and then there's the idea, you, and the uh, 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 UNCLOS, United Nations Law of the Sea, uh, had, had decided there was such a thing as economic interest, 25 miles and so on. So all these are new things, but then brought into the argument. It got too complicated for me, and I'm not being trained to think like that. I no longer can follow the argument. Uh, Professor Wong, can you do one more question? Or? Okay. Uh, sorry, I think I'm going to hijack this one. Um, <laughs> I just want to say, uh, first of all, thank you for an, an amazing talk. Um, uh, I just want to say I'm, I, I'm, I'm uh, well aware that history imbricates contemporary events, but I'm also trying to keep my Singapore citizenship. <laughs> so, um, uh, <laughs> And your, your talk reminded me of uh, this book, Arc of Containment, by the NTU professor, um, Nagoy, um, which basically argues that long before the Americans in Vietnam articulated a plan of, of domino effect containment, that um, Southeast Asia has, as a region has always been defined by an aversion to communism. Um, you know, even the the Japanese, people sometimes forget, were the most communist-averse country. And that's part of why it was so easy for the, for the Americans after World War II to fold the Japanese into their plan of regional defense. Um, and even, when, you know, even during the, the brief tenure of Japanese occupation of Southeast Asia, they were still concerned with the containment of, of communism. And so this is kind of a strand that, that you know, continues from, from British interest in the region all the way until, you know, uh, what we have now, kind of post-Vietnam um, post neocolonialism. And I think you, you explicate beautifully how Southeast Asia was, as a region, was in part defined by its aversion to communism and how Singapore, you know, kind of has this, this weird isolated case because it's, it's neither pro nor anti-communist, and it's, it's non-communist. Um, and so my, my question is, I was wondering if you could, if you could talk more about 
the challenges that that Singapore faced as as a kind of nation who is who is predominantly uh, ethnically Chinese, and so they 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 share that in common with with China. Um, yet at, at the same time, you know, it's an isolated nation state within a a, a non Chinese region. Um, that that is neither you know neither pro nor nor anti anti communist and how how perhaps how early Singapore leaders such as Lee Kuan Yew navigated those very murky waters. Well, you are you are getting very close to a sensitive subject. <laughs> <laughs> but let me let me put it this way: that we come to Singapore. Uh, Singapore wasn't supposed to exist as a country. It was a colony for most of the time. It was the, probably the last, or no, Brunei was the last country to become independent, but it didn't expect to be independent. I mean, most of you here will recall how it happened. Uh, I certainly grew up in the belief that we're all part of Malaya. I, I come from Malaya, so I had assumed that Singapore was part of Malaya. And my Singapore friends, of my generation anyway, assumed they were part of Malaya. It was only a matter of time before Malaya would become, uh, Singapore would be part of Malaya, and when they changed its name to, uh, extended itself to Malaysia, Singapore would be part of Malaysia. And that was given. It was not exactly welcome in everybody's eyes. Lots of disagreements about it, but it was understood because there was no other future planned. And the leaders of Singapore expected Singapore to be part of Malaya or Malaysia, and in fact, as you know, joined Malaysia under complicated circumstances. One of the most famous books when I was a young man was uh, Malaysian Malaysia. Uh, it was uh, invented by uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew uh, and accepted at that time, Malaysian Malaysia, and what he meant by that was that, that all the states would be equal and Singapore would have an equal state position in that, in that uh, country. But it, and it actually joined. It was there for nearly two years before it was separated. And frankly, I was surprised when Singapore left Malaysia. And as far as I know, so was just about everybody I knew. We were surprised. If I'm not mistaken, even Mr. Lee Kuan Yew seemed to be a little bit surprised <laughs> when, when it happened. But he had a, he had a role to play in, in, in accepting that position. But the point was, Singapore did not expect to be independent. And as you all know, it had none of the characteristics of an independent government. It didn't have its own finances or treasury. It didn't have its own army. It, uh, it just had an island, as far as I know. Uh, an island with uh, with the PAP in, in charge, uh, responsible, but uh, not many other characteristics of an independent nation state for at least a few months. And it took a few months to, for the leaders and a civil service in Singapore to reconstitute the whole state to think in independent terms, but they had to move very, very fast. And when you look at what they did in the first few months, it was remarkable how quickly they moved to get themselves recognized by the United Nations, recognized by most countries in the world, and, and gain its sovereignty, accepted international sovereignty in the eyes of the whole world, and join every organization that they could join as quickly as they could. Now that is remarkable activity. But that, if that doesn't change history, I don't know what does. I mean, that's completely reshaped and redefined the history of uh, not only Singapore, but history of Malaysia, history of Malaya, and, and this history of Southeast Asia. Because when ASEAN was formed two years later, if, the, if Singapore had not been independent, it would only be four states. But we had a fifth state when Singapore was asked to join Actually, Singapore, I think, wondered whether they should join or not, but they did. And it was quite right. They quite rightly joined it for its own sake. And it joined it and became, from the almost day one, a very active member of ASEAN. 
to try and make sure that their position in ASEAN was secure, and ultimately to make sure that ASEAN would be a living organization that would be of great importance, greater and greater strategic importance to the region of Southeast Asia. Already they understood there was this region of Southeast Asia between China and India. How would this divided region between communists and anti-communists survive that war, that Cold War or hot war? How would it survive and ultimately become a region that could have its own identity? All that took a long time. I mean, we often forget Oh, it depended on what? It depended on Vietnam winning. It depended on Cambodia not wanting to join, not wanting to be dominated by Vietnam and seeking to be really independent. And Singapore had a big role in this. If you read the history of uh, Singapore's diplomatic service, one of its most important first jobs of the diplomatic service that it made a mark in international affairs was in helping the independence of Cambodia uh, at that point so that then Cambodia could join ASEAN. Not that they did immediately, but they could separate from, in, from Vietnam as an independent country. And that was not at all easy. It, it, and that, interestingly enough, that succeeded because both the United States and China agreed that Cambodia should be independent from Vietnam. Isn't that interesting? They see China and United States on the same side on that one. And Singapore was on the right side. And it, it, it worked. Very well, so in the end you could end up by, by the fact that Cambodia could be independent, it enabled Laos to be independent. It's all related, because otherwise Vietnam could easily have dominated the whole of French Indochina as they probably wanted to. In that context, the end of the Cold War, drawing the four mainland countries into Southeast Asia gave the region a new life. In 1967, it was one kind of region, half Southeast Asia. In 1999, when Cambodia joined, it was all 10 countries. So Southeast Asia as a region with a political identity as a region only started in 1999. It's only 20 odd years from now. It's very early history. But considering how young this ASEAN of 10 countries is I think it is remarkable that it stayed united so far and so far being able to, at least on most of the important subjects, speak with one voice, as they say. So to be able to be able to do that is not at all easy. Look at the problems they have with Myanmar at the moment. I mean, the ASEAN really don't know what to do. They wouldn't know what to do with, with Myanmar at the moment. But they're still hanging on grimly to being in a region. Now, that is reimagining Southeast Asia in a very, very tough way. How do you imagine the Southeast Asia surviving all these problems, not only of US-China uh, international power struggle going on, but within the region, the lack of unanimity about each other's countries. All 10 countries are different. I mean, I have uh, tremendous problems trying to understand each member of Southeast Asia. I mean. <laughs> One or two is difficult enough, but all 10 is very, very difficult. But I'm ex con continually, consistently surprised by the leaders of these countries when they meet regularly and continually reaffirm their commitment to stay a region because it is their shared interest to be a region and to speak with one voice on every possible subject that they can. And if they can continue to do that and gain the respect of all the neighbors of that region in the context of a new competition in a multipolar world involving the Indo-Pacific when Southeast Asia is smack in the middle of those two oceans, that is a history to be looking forward to, nothing to be afraid of. We should be helping to build that up. And if historians have a role to play at all in all this, and you can see how difficult and how delicate a matter it is, they must be given the freedom to speak up for what is true and what is correct and do not, and do not allow falsities, lies, to be used for national interest by any country. And if historians have the freedom to do that, continuously insisting 
on as much of the truth as possible that historians can do by re referring to sources, to the documents, to at least proximities to the truth and not obvious lies, the, con the historians can still do a service. But it is not easy, and it will never be easy, and that has always been true anyway. Uh, thank you so much again to Professor Wong. Please give him one more round of applause. <laughs> and now uh, Professor Borschberg would like to give some closing remarks. Well, testing. Okay. Before you all run off, I think these two young men deserve a really loud, Matthew and Luke have done a smashing job. We have so many people who have contributed to the success today. We have everyone from camera people to the caterers. We have the lovely parents here as well, who have been um, always, huh? and all right, and the grandma, I saw her, yes, she was uh, very, very concerned that we were not going to go hungry, there she is. So thank you all very much for coming, thank you for your time today, and I think I will, do I hand over to anyone, to you, to, to Luke. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you. Honorable guests, distinguished speakers, and esteemed members of the ACM, on behalf of the Davis Projects for Peace Foundation, it is my utmost pleasure to conclude today's conference. I sincerely hope that you all have obtained valuable insights from the contributions of our exceptionally knowledgeable speakers on how we as nationals, residents, or even visitors of Singapore may rethink how we remember Southeast Asia's rich and long-spanning past, or at least what we think Southeast Asia's long and rich spanning past. For my final words, I would like to express my gratitude to our speakers, you, the audience for your engagement, and the Asian Civilizations Museum for providing this very beautiful venue. And I would also like to thank the, all the staff making the logistics of this conference go so smoothly, so video, audio, reception, and catering. And for my final special thanks, it goes to Christina and Eric Wee for making this conference possible. Matthew, Stephanie, and I are extremely grateful. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> Free to go. Thank you very much.